Hi there. Uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, good afternoon to everyone who's tuning in from New Zealand, who's uh, joining us from Australia as well. Nice to have everyone. Um, also, many attendees come on already today for the first day of our world tour. Um, it's not something I expected to be doing. It would be a, a kind of a third virtual world tour in a row. I think we might have to change the name sometime in the near future if it has to go on any longer. Might not be quite such a world tour anymore, but um, yeah, fingers crossed we get back to some more in-person events very shortly. If you haven't tuned into a session with me before or met me, um, I'm Kieran O'Donnell. I work with Locus as a FME consultant. Um, and just in general, I guess my kind of my particular interest is in automation and, and really just trying to make uh, simple solutions to quite complex problems. So um, last year I I did a presentation um, on extending with APIs. Um, that was part one. And this time I kind of really more and maybe focus on some different APIs and also I guess maybe a little bit of a different idea as to how you can use FME to develop with APIs and kind of try and grow that maturity around it as well. So um, yeah, this session will be about 25 minutes and, and hopefully there's something here for everyone as well. Um, so we'll just do a quick introduction. Um, I guess I've kind of done a bit of an introduction already, but um, I just want for those of you who haven't come across one before and then um, dive into some of the reasons as to why we'd use an API and then in particular spend a lot of time um, looking at APIs and how we can actually integrate with APIs using custom transformers inside FME. Um, in particular I've got one really good use case I found with uh, the SharePoint API which I know SharePoint's a, a very widely used system in a lot of organizations and then a couple of other APIs, more just to kind of, I guess, develop the the ideas and the understanding around how different APIs could be used in different ways as well. I actually just had to come in and update the slide after um, watching Ruby's presentation first thing this morning. I, I noticed I was working off a, a 10 plus. Don't increase that, but um, by now you've probably all heard a little bit about Locus and, and what we do. Um, and, and yeah, I guess that's um, I'm sure probably the, the vast majority of you out there have come across APIs before, um, but for those of you that haven't, API stands for Application Programming Interface, and really an API is just a, a great way to access data, server software, or other applications um, via kind of a secure gateway that allows two systems to talk to one another securely. Um, you need to make API and what's returned is often known as the response. So it's kind of this workflow where you you make a, a request or a query and you ask for something and an API returns information um, back to you. Um, that makes FME a really good candidate to actually kind of work with an API because it's that kind of looping workflow where you need to push and pull and, and unpack and manipulate information as you go. So I guess that's why I find um, an excellent tool for using with APIs where you've got other tools which may be really good at making the requests but actually unpacking them into into the information that you need is, is actually quite a tricky task sometimes. Um, you might be thinking why well, use an API? Um, there's a lot of support obviously for formats out there already um, but I think that probably the key thing about using an API is that you can access data or systems um, which might have really tight security and, and you might be actually unable to access directly without the use of an API. Um, I know last year I worked on um, something regarding the live locations of all of the buses around Auckland, um, which Auckland Transport shares over an open data platform. Um, now that was a really good example of that because there's no way <laughs> me just sitting out here is it ever going to be able to which stays directly where those buses are and, and kind of a direct connection sense but Auckland Transport being able to expose them over an API makes something which is actually I mean not that long ago really difficult to get access to um, really easy as just a member of the public as well. 
Um, and, and another reason for using APIs could be around um, just that, you know, wanting to use something in lieu of manual, manual interaction. Um, and then you can kind of systematically order any other data workflow, but it could be maybe not something so much data related as it is, um, you know, application related. Um, I, again, last year, I, I worked on quite a few things with ArcGIS Online, which is a, a great platform because of how easy it is to do everything via the GUI, but because you don't actually have kind of underlying data access in a lot of, in a lot of the kind of traditional sensors, it makes it a really tricky thing to, um, to kind of automate and overhead if you become an, an administrator in some of those environments as well. Um, so really, I, I guess I kind of like of it to like thinking of it as API use is really a great option when you want to perform a task which is not natively supported inside FME. Um, so you might get really excited, like I do often with APIs as well, and decide that you want to develop something. It's always a good idea to look in support for this first. Um, if you've got access to say an SQL database um, to request data and you know read and write access into that versus an API access um, to access that same data, it's probably a good idea to go with the native one. Um, you probably get a lot better performance out of something like that. Whereas if you're trying to you know work with a system or a data source which doesn't actually have support to pull from directly, that is often where can be a really good use. Um, and also APIs just really help you to extend that functionality of FME. Uh, this is which are sometimes otherwise impossible as well. Um, so really you might still be able to do 80, 90% of the job with just standard functionality, normal regular transformers, um, typical readers and writers. Um, but then if you want to kind of take things to the next level, um, using an API to extend on that is, is kind of a really good way of doing a full end-to-end -end automation as well. An example I think I showed of that last year as well was just around um, attachments in ArcGIS Online as well. So you've obviously got the, you know, really good native support for the ArcGIS Online hosted feature service reader and writer in, in FME natively. Um, but then you throw in something like um, attachments, which obviously attachments can come in all different sort of shapes, sizes. You could have a many to one relationship between one feature in that hosted feature service and many attachments, different formats that you're kind of starting to integrate with. Um, that's in pretty much an impossible workflow inside something like FME natively. But if you integrate using the hosted feature service reader and extend on it with the API, that's where you can build this kind of complete, really just leveraging the two in tandem with one another. It's, it's not really saying one of them's better than the other, although native is often better if you, um, if you do have the support straight out of the box as well. Um, and, and really, I think today, what I wanna spend the majority of the, the presentation talking about is just APIs and custom transformers. Um, I haven't actually seen a huge amount of development of custom transformers and it may be that they're keeping them private as well but um i have really started getting into the idea of um you know when you're building a, a workflow which uses an api i think it's a great idea to actually parameterize it and then that can be repurposed um sometimes it's hard to know how to do that and and i think i do want to spend a bit of time showing kind of the different ways that you can approach that um, and, and really, I think it's just something that it's a practice kind of thing and a habit. So once you do it once, you start to kind of be um, a really good way to um, yeah, create a custom transformer so that you can repurpose this work again and again. Um, you'll see Safe Software have actually published quite a number of custom transformers as well as our really good user community out there. Um, I've seen some great ones coming out um, regarding ArcGIS as well in, in the last couple of years and they make my life so much easier as well. So um, a lot of them though, you'll see that they actually um, whether or not you know it and, and I think that's the beauty of it. You don't need to know how the API works quite so well anymore if you've got a custom transformer which kind of does that for you um 
what I do really like as well is that you can often actually look under the hood of those transformers and get a better understanding of how those APIs work before starting to kind of, you know, try and extend on them yourself or, or try and develop something from scratch. You might be able to take something which already exists and I don't do 30% of what you want it to do, but at least it kind of gives you that, you know, that sharp learning curve might be kind of softened a bit um, and gives you an indication of how the whole, whole request and response sort of loop works um, to manipulate it to, to do the action that you want. A um, couple of examples of these, you've got the Maximo Object Creator. It's a, an enterprise asset management system. ArcGIS Online Batch Geocoder using the ArcGIS REST. Places Connector, which I have never actually heard of, but it, it uses another one of Google's APIs. And it really just gives you that benefit of, you know, using a regular transformer rather than constantly using HTTP callers and JSON flatteners and everything which takes a whole lot of time to, to unpack every time you open up your workspace again. Um, there's a whole bunch more. If, if you haven't spent a lot of time looking at the hub, I would definitely recommend um, just kind of going APIs are new to you. Just even just type the keyword API here, which is exactly what I did. Um, you might find there's you know there's systems out there which you haven't actually, which may be kind of in the realm that you're working in, but you haven't really looked at these transformers or connectors before. Um, so definitely a, a worthwhile experience just going on the hub to to see what's out there and and see what could be leveraged as well. Um, I'm going to stop talking shortly. Well, not stalking, not stop so much, but actually just um, sort of dive into FME. Um, I do really like to spend the majority of the presentation that I've got um, actually just looking at FME as well. Um, I'm sure pretty much everyone has come across SharePoint before. Um, even SharePoint is just part of anyone's regular Office 365 account, even if you're in a really small organization. Um, so it's not just a, a large enterprise kind of tool anymore. Um, but really something that I've struggled with for being able to share data um, and for people who don't necessarily work in an IT space or a data space um, kind of set up something which acts like a database in a sense but it, it's also an extremely frustrating one to work with because at the same time it really doesn't act like a database either so um, I definitely understand the value of SharePoint. It's almost like it's taken over Microsoft Access as this whole shadow IT kind of realm um, but it is really valuable it's definitely like ignoring and deciding that um, you don't want to touch anything that's in SharePoint. Um, so I'll, I'd like to talk a little bit about um, kind of some of the, the learnings I had from a, a recent SharePoint integration I did. Um, but I do think that SharePoint would be a great candidate for um, repurposing some API workspaces which have been created to access that SharePoint data um, because the platform does follow a very repetitive architecture you know there's there's fixed parts and there's variable parts so if you can repurpose the things that are that are fixed um then you can work on the the variable stuff um and you inside your workspace so i'm just going to pop my camera off probably the session and, and kind of work on fme directly so those of you who haven't seen the sharepoint um api it works off this kind of idea of um what they call um, which is create, uh, read, update, and delete. Um, so very much a, a data kind of focused, um, yeah, REST API. Um, many of you may have seen this SharePoint web connection, which is, is built in natively to FME. Um, now, I don't use this in this workflow, and the reason being is that uh, the, the client that I did this for is a very, you know, understandable kind of environment um, and there are some limitations kind of to do with the SharePoint side around your sharing um, in particular this one I think is um, I, I believe they've changed it in a recent update but not at the time of creation but essentially registering an app like you do with the SharePoint web connection gives you um, this kind of permission on all sites which is not a great security model um, so really I, I used an API to act do a completely different workflow um, to authenticate in a different way and, and still request data exactly as I needed to. 
Um, so this authentication workflow actually simulates the browser experience. So you provide your username and password in the same way that you would if you were logging in through, you know, Chrome or, or IE or whatever browser you're using. Um, and it returns these cookies, which actually are sort of a browser as you're accessing information. Um, so a very different workflow in terms of authentication, um, but it gave it gave me kind of what I needed in this circumstance to to make sure I could kind of make a more I guess restriction sorry restrictive way of accessing data and, and certainly not a full um, a full access to all sites kind of deal. Um, I then go through another workflow to find all this SharePoint site and then and then request the records from the list. So the reason I have to use the API here is because obviously for, for those of you who have tried it before, there's a there's a Microsoft SharePoint list reader. Now unfortunately due to having that kind of limitation around the permissions and the organization um, this was for, it just means something like this is completely out of the question and, and that's where the API becomes yeah a really valuable tool to say um, support anymore we you know or the native the native way of doing this doesn't work for us we actually need to do it um, in a different workflow um, but at the same time this is an extremely cumbersome kind of operation for what is the equivalent a SharePoint list reader um, so in this sense I guess what I decided was if you know, if I'm going to spend all of this upfront investment in terms of, um, you know, in terms of actually creating these workflows, I may as well actually make some objects out of this because um, in, in this kind of setting, you know, doing this authentication loop, which took a little while to work out because it's, it's a bit of a tricky one. Um, why don't I actually make um, a transformer for it? So we, I call this the SharePoint cookie feature. Um, provide the, you know, the, the SharePoint tenant, which might be locus.sharepoint.com or, or whatever our SharePoint site is and, and pop in my username and then enter a password um, what that will do, and, and I've actually pre canned one for us as well. What that should do is go ahead and, and actually just fetch these two cookies and who, uh, are essentially required to perform, you know, any sort of API um, request that I want inside inside SharePoint. Um, now the work, the next step behind that would be to also say, okay, let's let's actually search. You know, let's search any all lists inside that organization as well um, at, within a certain site. Um, so again, that's that second. Um, in my standard workflow, I've, I've wrapped up into a custom transformer. Now, using that SharePoint tenant, a particular site name, and the cookies I get in the in the former request, I actually get a list of all of the lists which exist at this site. And a, and a count for how many lists, sorry, how many records are within each of that list as well. And then thirdly, I guess the, the last step in that is actually to request the information from the list. I, again, I, I'll need the tenant. Um, I'll need the cookie and well, the two cookies I requested to make sure that I actually have the, the correct permission to request the information in here. And then in particular, I wanna you know request um, data from a given list so I could pick out any in here um, maybe I'll pick a small one just to save time but let's say consultants hopefully yep we should get eight records returned now, of course there's no attributes exposed because that's dynamic um, but if I just now throw on something like an attribute exposer I can go ahead and, and after this beautiful tool came out, I think it was in 2020 possibly, but exposing from a feature cache was the best for the work that I do in a long time. Um, it now knows all of the attributes which have actually been queried 
as a result of me using um, that SharePoint list um, requester. So really, you know, that's an enormous overhead. If every time you wanted to read data from a list required a, um, you know, required a workflow that was this large. Um, also, it's extremely complicated. So um, if you wanted to share quite, you know, it isn't quite as advanced with this sort of thing. It's very tough to share a workspace like this, but if you actually wrap these up as, as these nice objects, all someone will need to do is provide, you know, their SharePoint tenant username and password, um, and then enter the name of the site that they want, um, or the name of the list that they want data from. And, and you've essentially built a workflow that can be repeated in any single SharePoint kind of implementation you know, security limitations aside, of course, um, because everyone's um, environments will be somewhat different, unfortunately, but ultimately that should be pretty much static against all SharePoint. So um, that is quite, a, I guess, a good way to, to repurpose something rather than kind of re, you know, having to rejig that every single time. Um, now, lastly, I've, I've got these other two ones, which I wanted to touch. That is just the these other APIs. So we've got um, Strava and GeoNet. Um, I think I'll show show GeoNet first because um, it's really just an, another way of doing something similar and, and trying to um, you know repurpose these things. So um, I guess probably the majority of our New Zealand customers here will know what GeoNet is, but um, I I'm, imagine you'll have one that's very similar in, in Australia as well, and this just watches. Um, the geological activity in New Zealand, GeoNet will, you know, register the earthquakes and all that sort of thing. Yeah, which you can request data from. We've also got a WFS. Um, now, I guess this would be applicable to all in New Zealand, and, and if you were to create one for a similar kind of portal in, in Australia as well, you could you could build that very easily. But what I've created here um, at the very bottom of this page how I would request um, using that GeoNet API is, is basically how I would request um, earthquakes within um, a particular date range um, and of a certain over a certain magnitude um, using the, the API and how I then need to unpack it in order to you know turn that into be used. I think this one's actually quite large. I can't remember how wide this query is, and and also reprojected into a particular um, coordinate system as well. Now, again, that's 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 not an extremely complicated workflow, but I guess I quite like the idea of kind of modularizing this again. And and here you see we've got um, a transformer which I've created called the GeoNet Earthquake Query. Set the parameters on this. There's, you know, there's only a few things that you actually need, want to configure. Um, so I can, I can make this dynamic, and we can use the calendar um, user parameter type. Um, maybe we'll do, yeah, let's do. Oh, that's future time. There's probably not too much point in querying into the thirty first. Um, but you can see here we've used a number parameter as well with a kind of a slider. Um, if rates go zero to ten, although I'm not sure if GeoNet's always in that. But let's say greater than 8.55 is hopefully not going to turn much. So we'll, we'll drop it down to a 5 and, and set the coordinate system again using a user parameter inside a custom transformer. So um, if I now run this, we've actually got an object which which is essentially, well, it's a transformer, but it's actually kind of working as a data source with parameters built in um, in order to allow you to as if it's a reader or a data source that you're that you're I guess adjusting what data you want we're actually just performing a dynamic query on an API but using that within a custom transformer um, to to query exactly what we want as well so a, another way of thinking of it too um, so you can see there are these magnitudes that that's filtered for anything greater than a five and if we look at the I think it's the origin date we filtered 
origin time is the, the time of the quake. Oh, here it is. Um, we should have everything that's basically just occurring in, in March um, of this year. Looks like we have a lot of quakes over five. Um, so yeah, very much an, another example of, of a way that you could, I guess, modularize your use of APIs into custom transformers. Um, that's what the custom transformer actually looks like. But I guess the idea would be that if, if this is something that's used more than once, there's no need for someone to reinvent the wheel or redevelop this again. If you can just um, set up a custom transformer, um, that's, that's very much um, can be reused by anyone because ultimately that's probably the only parameters that someone actually needs to, um, you know, that someone actually needs to modify. If you've got any questions, feel free to pop them in the chat. Um, I know I am probably running a little bit over time, so I'll, I'll wrap up very quickly. Um, but the, the last one I've got here is, is Strava. Some of you may use Strava for kind of exercise. Um, I think it was Gerhard over at SAFE um, spent a lot of time, or I imagine a lot of time creating this Strava web connection, um, which is, is really helpful for if anyone wants to be able to um, query API looks like um, can be overwhelming if you're coming to and from APIs, you know, sporadically. So if you if you do invest some time in creating this, um, again, um, a, a good idea would be to use a custom transformer. So here, what I've done here is created what I've just called the Strava Activity Finder. Um, now, there's very little I've actually set on the parameters here, but ultimately, this just uses that Strava which we had set up um, over at Safe Software. Um, and this is basically, I mean, this is the extent that I've gone with this custom transformer, but ultimately this will just go and query whoever is whoever this web connection is set up to, utilize, uh, to authenticate with. So go ahead and query their, um, I guess all of their activities and then output it to two different tabs, whether it's run or cycle. So um, this is my, Cycling, not much cycling on Strava at the very least anyway. Um, and basically what's going on is if we look while oh, that's running, is, is it's just going and requesting these activities um, from um, Strava, converting date times, um, doing things like using the encoded polyline, which is, is how geometry is captured inside Strava. Moving it, manipulating your attributes, changing speed. Not sure why I did that. It's a long time since I looked at this one and, and doing these things like rounding. Um, you know, very, very simple things. But again, if you don't need to do it every time you want to access a data source like this, um, you really can just kind of build that into a transformer, which, which kind of makes your life easier and hopefully saves your, um, <laughs> which, which saves um uh cool um i'm gonna wrap up there i'm just seeing a, a question pop up um sorry that's been a bit of a, a whirlwind i guess i really just wanted to focus on the idea of yeah this whole if you do something once then then just do it once <laughs> again um i've been very guilty of this over the years of, of doing something that's you know cost me a bit of time and, and use an API and, and I've, at the time I've been really, um, you know, I've understood the API really well. You come back to it three months time and it's literally like it never happened. So um, if you can kind of save yourself that, you know, reinvestment of relearning an API, um, I think a custom transformer is a great, great way to do that. Um, I just had a question from Cleo come through um, about a <laughs> big fan of the Strava API even do it <laughs> i know what you mean i don't actually strive on my bikes but i do my runs um but cu accessing custom transformers that others have made um i that is a good question so any custom transformers which people would like to share um, can be shared to the fme hub um so if you go just to hub.safe.com you'll see down here there is a um you know a filter for transformers and for web connections um, 
we yeah would suggest also looking at the web connections because from my experience um web connections or sorry the authentication component of using an api is always the hardest once you're authenticated and you have access um things do become a lot easier so um yeah try and utilize the web connections if they exist as well um but otherwise transformers here um i haven't actually shared any of these transformers to the hub at this stage but it is out there in the near future um again it probably just comes down to me putting up some documentation which i have not necessarily been um as as good at doing as i have uh been telling people to do um and and at that follow-up question as well if you want to see how someone else's um uh the logic behind other transformers this is actually a not that well-known secret but it's not really a secret either if you right click on any custom transform it's not password protected you can right click and hit edit and you see here that is a you know how this custom transformer actually functions in terms of using all of the other um transformers within it um i actually don't know if i can you can actually then go and modify that custom transformer as well so um, i can add a separate output port and if we jump back to the gone and essentially i've just gone ahead and edited that custom transformer directly in my own installation not in the hub version of it as well um so yeah you can go in and, and take what someone's done and extend on it to kind of um you know help you know whether it's improving the development or just extend on the functionality um it is really really nice to be able to just see what's actually gone in under the hood of someone else's as well I know I've gone over a little bit of time and I want to, um, yeah, and I just want to make sure that I don't eat into the next person's time any more than I already have. Um, APIs are really great to extend native functionality, um, which aren't supported out of the box. Um, it, there's obviously this upfront development time, um, which I'm aware is can be a bit cumbersome. So really the way that you want to limit that is actually, um, you know, create purpose it and make sure that that development time can be reduced because these things do take time and and you know it's it's an upfront cost so if you can reduce how many more you have to do then yeah that's a great way to look at it and if you are lo looking to get started i would very much suggest looking at the fme hub um for a, as a, i guess a good source of inspiration to get started with apis share your work so that others can see them as well um if you if you feel um that might be of use to anyone else um then yeah definitely put it up on the hub and yeah I, ho I hope i see some more coming out there in the next wee while um thanks all for joining really enjoyed giving this presentation and um hope you enjoyed the rest of the world tour thanks thanks for tuning in